So firstly, what do we mean by culture? Well, culture refers to a way of life for a particular society. Now we can identify a culture of a particular society or country through its language, its customs, its beliefs, its flag, their norms, the arts, the knowledge and collective identities. If we take Britain as an example, we obviously use the English language. We have the Union Jack. We're well known for our TV and our comedy and for Shakespeare and for our Premier League football and of course, for our tea drinking abilities. So what you can see from that is that culture is very distinct. Britain has a very distinct culture. So what it would be worth doing at the moment is just pausing the video for a moment and try and have a go at doing exactly the same as I just did, but with a few other different countries. Perhaps if I gave you countries such as the USA or Ireland or further afield, let's say Japan, you should be able to come up with a list of cultural identities for that particular country. So what about identity? Well, identity is not as straightforward as just one, one word or one term because identity can be split into two different parts. We have our personal identity which is how we view ourselves, and also our social identity. This is how we present ourselves to others. Now we're gonna learn more about identity when we get into video three, looking at ideas of the self. So if some of these ideas on identity and the difference between the two don't make sense, they should become a little bit more easy to understand as we go through the videos on catch up. So, we're gonna think about five different types of culture. And as I'm running through these, you can think which ones you already know or which ones you think you need a little bit of a refresher on. So we have folk culture, we have global culture, high and low culture, mass and popular culture, and also subcultures. So let's do them in order. Let's start with folk culture. You may not have heard of this one and that would be understandable because folk culture is a term that we used to use. In other words, folk culture refers to the old traditional cultures of the past. This was when people lived in very simple, small rural communities and lived a much simpler life. So we're talking before televisions and smartphones and all of those other things that now distract us in their life today. And so people pass the time through very simple practices such as folk dancing or folk singing, um, singing around a campfire, uh, very simple times before I say anything like, like technology that we have today. If you've ever seen something like Morris dancing, that's an example of folk culture as well. So why is it important to know what folk culture is? Well, it's important to know because you can see how different things are now compared to the culture that we have today, which is global culture. You're probably aware of what we mean by globalization. So a global culture refers to cultures which transcends national borders. Now, what does that mean? That means when norms and practices exist in more places than one. So many different places around the world use global technology, language and fashions, not just from their own country, but they take and use and amalgamate and fuse all of those different areas from lots of different countries. Just have a think what you may have at home, which isn't British. I can imagine that many of you may have, for example, a Samsung phone, which is from Korea. You may have a Sony PlayStation from Japan. You may have Vans trainers from America or Nike trainers from America. You may have some British stuff as well. You may have a Jack Wills t-shirt, for example. But what you'll notice of all the things around you in your home are not just from your home country or not just from Britain. There will be amalgamation from lots of different places. We're also seeing this in behaviors and language as well. So for example, the English language is often referred to as a global language because it's spoken in so many different parts of the world. So even if some countries have their home language, what's called their mother tongue, they may also be learning English from a really young age. And the reason they do that is because they are aware that it's such a global language to be able to use in a variety of different places. Our next culture, is high and low culture. So what do we mean by high and low culture? Well, if we were to add the word status in, this might make a little bit more sense. So high culture are those things with high status, whereas low culture are those things with low status. So what, what do we mean by that? Well, take something like the images showing on the left-hand side of going to the opera. The opera is often seen as quite elitist. It has a high status. It has a high caliber. It's very expensive to go to. 
it can be quite difficult to get seats to the very uh, to the very best operas within London or surrounding areas. And so uh, many people who go to opera say that it has this kind of high caliber, high status feel to it. Whereas we look at the image on the right, this is some people sitting down on a weeknight watching some reality TV. Maybe they are watching Love Island, for example. Now, why is that considered low culture? Well, it's easy to watch. It doesn't take much intellect or capability to watch it. It's very easy to watch. It's probably free to watch other than your TV subscription. And it's not very elitist. Masses and masses of people watch it. So when we're talking about high and low culture, just think of it as a status point of view. What Pierre Bourdieu calls cultural capital. Does the activity have a high status or a low status? At this moment in time, it would be worth pausing the video and see if you can come up with five other examples of high cultural activities and five examples of low cultural activities. You've got opera and reality TV to get you started. See if you can come up with five more on each side. And so on to our next area of culture, and I've put these two together, mass culture and popular culture, because there's a crossover. There is a slight difference though. Let's start with mass culture. Mass culture is a set of ideas and values that develop from a common exposure to the same media, news sources, music and art. If you think of the word mass, it means a mass number or a large number of people actually do actually take part in the activity. It's often said that mass culture is produced. So if you take that example that I had on the previous slide, something like reality TV, that's an a well-produced or even an overproduced piece of media that is given out to people. So it's made on purpose because they know a large number or a mass number of people are going to watch it. Popular culture is based on the taste of large numbers of people rather than a more limited or restricted educated elite. So again, popular culture is something that's enjoyed by large numbers of people. You've probably heard the expression pop music, for example, pop music. Uh, is a shortened version of the word popular. Popular culture is often said to be consumed. That means it's taken on board by larger numbers of people. So at this point, you can probably see why these two cross over. Let's take something like Premier League football. Premier League football is produced. And what I mean by that is the cameras are set up to record every single game. Those Footage from those games is then sold onto lots of different companies. So that could be Sky or BT, different uh, media companies around the world. And so it's well-produced package. Um, it's extremely expensive as well, but it's also consumed as well. So it's consumed around the world by millions, if not billions of people. And so something like Premier League football could be seen as both mass culture and popular culture. And so on to our final type of culture, subcultures. You're probably aware of this one. Have a look at the image on the left hand side. What I'd like you to do, maybe pause the video, see if you can work out what some of those subcultures are being shown there through the images. So let me just pick a few out. You may have spotted a, uh, a punk. You may have spotted a goth, a hipster, a rapper. OK, there's many different types there. Rastafarian is also another one there. Rasta, um, a hippie there in the top left as well. So subcultures, what we mean by that, it refers to a smaller, distinct group within a larger culture. Sometimes subcultures is defined as a group within a group. These subcultures often have different beliefs or interests with those of the larger majority group. So sometimes someone might walk past you and they have quite a distinct look and you have to do a double take. You know, if there was someone with a, a green mohawk, for example. So although they exist in the major society, they may be part of a smaller distinct break off group as well. Subcultures can also be split into pro or anti depending on their behaviours and attitudes towards different agencies of socialisation. Now, you may have come across this when you are studying education, and that's a good example of this. So Paul Willis, for example, he conducted a study called Learning to Labour. You may be aware of this, but he talked about many working class boys having anti-school subcultures. That meant that they went against what the teachers wanted to do. Um, they also went against their employees later on at work. They kind of misbehaved, but they had an anti-school subculture. In other words, they worked against the agency of socialization. 
whereas some groups have a pro school subculture. You may, for example, remember looking at ethnicity and some groups who perform very well, such as Chinese students or Indian, are often said to have a pro-school subculture. That is that they follow the rules or more likely to conform and that is why they are often very successful within school. So subcultures are often thought of to be anti, but remember they can be pro as well.